All right, uh, good evening everyone and welcome to the 18th of uh, this uh, Silver Jubilee Talks. Uh, online people, if you can just confirm, we are audible. Anas? Uh, yes, Vishal, I can hear you. No, so this should be confirmed. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, great. All right, so uh, as just a bit of a background uh, before I hand over to Professor uh, Singh to talk about the department. Uh, so we started this uh, as part of our uh, Silver Jubilee. So Silver Jubilee of the and this program, which started a year before the department started. And uh, since the department started a year later, we thought let's make it a two year program because in these two years we'll have 25 of these events, which also allows us to bring potentially each batch one at a time to introduce themselves and say what they're doing. So for the first event, we had the first batch, second event. Okay, that's an exercise in itself. Uh, I took away my watch as well, thinking it's the watch, but I don't know. I can't watch out for what it is, but phone is there. So I'm really keeping distance from everything that I could. Maybe I'm charged, that doesn't matter, but all right. Yeah, so. All right, uh, Abhijit, next time you need to sort this out for us. Okay, it's working. Something worked. All right, great. <laughs> right, let's do the wall. All right. Okay, so let's do that here. This way. Right. So we have one more expert. Great, thank you. So, um, yeah, with, so with that idea, we have sort of, we are now into the 18th, today is the 18th episode. And the idea is that uh, over these 25 events, we'd have spoken to 100 experts. Uh, typically, in each of these sessions, we try to bring at least one person from academia, uh, one or two from practice, and ideally at least one alumni uh, to know what they are. Uh, this time, uh, it's uh, slightly different. We have got two of our alumni, one uh, in person here and one sitting in Perth. Uh, and uh, we'll try to listen to not only uh, you know, what they have to say about design, but also the idea is to get to know them and their journeys because that's something we don't normally get in talks. You go places, you listen to talks, we don't really get to know people, right? So part of the idea is to also try to understand people. Uh, and keep it short, given that we started a bit late. So with that, I'll invite Professor Singh to come and talk about uh, the department a bit. We do that as a practice every time. So we move a bit faster with it, but still it's a good idea to introduce what the department is. Scientific. This is where you have to evidence in science by repetitive and experience. Okay. Okay. So, part of this uh, thing, usually it is. Uh, mm, presented by our chairman, but uh, today chairman is uh, not available, so I'm doing his uh, bit. Uh, yeah, so um, it is a brief uh, introduction to sort of where we, when we started and uh, where we are, why you think that we uh, did reasonably well during these uh, 25 years. Um, that is uh, both for our uh, satisfaction as also uh, telling our growth to uh, people who uh, do not know much of us. Yes, we started as a program in 1997 as a, a program uh, between a, a, from mechanical engineering department as a, a like MTech program. It also started as an MDES program, but because the nature of the program was uh, different, it required input from diverse uh, fields. So uh, faculty or the people from uh, the then Center for Electronic Design and Technology CDT, Management uh, Sciences, and uh, Erstwhile Metallurgy Department. All of them have changed their name, including us. Okay, uh, so we started this, and uh, <clears throat> the new program was uh, cobbled together after a lot of struggle with the institute because doing art in uh, science is sort of uh, not so acceptable because design is known to everyone, right? Who doesn't know design? Yeah, 
But the design we are talking about is not known to anybody. Yeah, the problem with design is that design is very interpretable word and each person has their interpretation and based on that when someone takes a decision sometimes we are at a disadvantage so that requires some struggle to start this program and thanks to professor uh, pradeep yamabar and uh, professor mitunjaya they managed to convince the institute that we need this in 1997 uh, even when it started this place was uh, not so presentable. This was an abandoned workshop, mechanical workshop. So we had to sort of clean this place first to make some rooms for ourselves, literally. And uh, so that took away some time in 1997. Uh, uh, and by 1998, what happened is that mechanical engineering department thought that, yes, it is a program fine, but it is quite different from us. Right. Why don't you give them a independent existence? We are quite happy. Yeah. <laughs> and the CPDM was born. Center for Product Design and Manufacturing was born in 1998 as an independent entity. However, unlike other departments in institute, we did not have any research program. We had only one program called MDES with 10 students and we are nurturing it. We had our first batch of research students. Maybe uh, four years, three, three, four years down the line. Right? Till then, we had only one program, which is quite unusual. Therefore, uh, the name center was kept there and it stuck with us. OK, so now and as we are uh, approaching this uh, 26 years, right, we grew uh, both in our size and scope. And uh, this place started becoming uh, not so uh, enough. Yeah, again, after uh, literally after 20 years of pleading, yeah, we got uh, approval for a new building, but COVID made a spoil sport, right? And the building is half done now. And uh, for remaining half, we are still uh, struggling because prices went up during that time. Uh, so a sort of brief statistics about, you know, uh, people talk about how we give ours, then we need some numbers. So in these 26 years, we wanted to check where we stand. Did we really float something that is uh, you know, uh, not at par with the rest of the world? Because you know, unless we do something which is quality, right, it is not worth running it for a long time. So we did a benchmarking with different schools and say which school we compare with right, in terms of composition and quality, what we do and what quality we do. It, and it, Tells quite uh, good about us that design among design schools, top uh, three design schools in India, we are one of that. Then, uh, and worldwide, we have some respectable position in terms of both our uh, research and uh, other activities, design and practice. And we have we started with four to stu ten students as a capacity, but first batch had only eight. Yeah, and uh, that way initially we are growing very slowly. So by now in 25 years, we have graduated about 415 uh, MDA students. And three, four years back, we started an, another program in manufacturing uh, on smart manufacturing side. And their two batches have already passed out. So we have 18 uh, MTech in smart manufacturing uh, done. And uh, in the beginning, we did not know much about what we are doing. What is the worth of it? Right. Once people started asking, OK, you are doing design. I don't see it in the market. Right. OK, they are writing thesis. They're getting degree. What else? They wanted product to be seen in the market. OK, so we started patenting and stuff. Right. Uh, so we have now roughly you know, this number should change uh, quite uh, fast because institute policy has changed. So we are now allowed to sell, apply for more patents. Earlier, there was some limitation on that front because it is cost money. OK, so uh, it is now 70. Yeah, must be. It's just uh, is somewhat dated. So uh, except for this, uh, how many PhD MDA students and uh, MTech students, things are continuously changing because any PhD to say student uh, submits this is that number will change. So you are about 72 uh, PhD is, uh, and MTech MSc research. Now it is called MTech by research. Uh, students passed out and uh, the students mostly also participate in international uh, design competitions and these are some of the notable achievements in different years 
and the diversity of the types of products. Our product, we focus on you know the things that are not only tangible, but there are certain manufacturing issues or some social uh, concerns that is addressed. So uh, those are uh, of that type uh, that is uh, persistent, right? So and uh, you know of late we are, the students are also making uh, startups and doing well so this is uh, the sql innovation which focuses on agri tech uh, especially for the small holdings of farmers less than uh, say uh, you know 5 hectare uh, 5 hectare 5 acres as, uh, which is the definition of small farmer so he uh, mainly supports them and uh, till now focusing a lot on the uh, mountainous areas for uh, horticultural uh, stuff and uh, yeah he's now profitable for quite some time and this is the other one which is the uh, the grass bionics prosthetic uh, uh, hand uh, this company and uh, that is also a part the, both the uh, things started as a uh, mdes uh, final uh, project final year we call it major project and then graduated towards that uh, some more are there but these are notable ones which we talk more and uh, this is the you have a video on this no okay so this is another thing that open day you know it is it is a general practice to showcase what we did uh, the students did in every design school right uh, similarly we also started quite early uh, even before the institute even thought about opening it up uh, to the rest of the world to show people what they are doing right so we we had this program called uh, the ripples Right, the, where the students will present their uh, work to common audience, and uh, a, we took it as a, a requirement that the at least the institute should know that uh, what we do and why uh, why you do that, the social connection, technical challenges, aesthetic elements, appeal, and you know market uh, marketability, and all these issues that the students address, the skill knowledge and the outreach, all these things that are required, often not all the elements are required in a science research type of things. So both for educating the uh, institute community at large and also showing to the rest of the world that at which level we are performing, we started this repulse. And uh, yeah, nowadays it has got merged with the other thing uh, about 10 years back, 2011, I believe, uh, institute started the open day. Uh, where all the labs are kept open for uh, one day, where you know anyone can come and uh, see. And nowadays it has become a huge event. Last year it was over sixty thousand uh, visitors in institute. This year it has crossed seventy thousand. So uh, in that we said that why to have two events? We club both of these together. So it is ripples and open day together. And these are some of the uh, pictures from that. Yeah. So variety of uh, things for both research as well as the uh, the post program students uh, showcase their work. Yeah, and uh, what else? Yes, hmm. it's zone and all. So now this is the other part when this uh, the uh, we wanted to expand our department. We had the difficulty of getting faculty because the institute doesn't take anyone who doesn't have a PhD. So now in design, getting a person with PhD is very tough. OK, so we said that if you want to expand and also as the time goes, more design schools will come where they get the PhDs, we will produce PhDs. So we had we started the PhD program in 2001 and by 2005 we started producing uh, PhDs and they are in uh, all over the world now in faculty positions. These are only mostly the faculty positions we have shown. Yeah, and uh, which, this is, you know, again, it is uh, and more, right? So, you know, uh, we are uh, doing reasonably well there, and uh, our vision, a more compacted version of our vision, was that uh, we want to pursue excellence in education, research, and practice in the areas of design and manufacturing, so as to support and develop the the products which are systemically complex, technologically intensive, and socially impactful solutions that are having the elements of functionality, aesthetics, uh, usability, and uh, sustainability. Whatever we do here, whether it's manufacturing, design, or research, we'll have these elements. And that mission translates to these as uh, missions, right? Uh, in each uh, segment, what we uh, propose to do. 
and these are some of their uh, achievements in that uh, front in terms of our uh, see uh, i should say the uh, academic uh, performance wise right how we uh, stand uh, numbers like the percentage of startups is increasing now so really what is 10 to 15 percent might have become 20 25 yeah that is because it there is a push from uh, government side there is a better facility from institute side right earlier uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, difficulty now there is a lot of support okay so because of which uh, the market is different so many students can also go to that side and yeah so these are the uh, four major initiatives national design innovation network which aims to uh, connect all the design communities uh, both in terms of the problem and the uh, solution space right anybody having a research design idea can contribute that anybody uh, having a problem can post there right and then they can collaborate so that is the idea here and then we also have a, a technology business incubator especially for the geriatric uh, requirements and uh, med tech uh, uh, testing and stuff and we have also a state of the art uh, smart factory it has got the facilities for product producing things as well as demonstrating how a smart factory could uh, be right a industry 4.0 problem that was started with is to address this transition from msme to smartness right there is a huge gap right people who uh, are uh, in a very much in a struggle phase in msme if you go and talk to them that you upgrade everything to computer right they are not going to listen to us okay but without that country doesn't benefit because they contribute a huge chunk of our economy so that upgradation is necessary so this was set up to show how that transition at different level of automation can gradually be enabled what do you do with the current machines and facilities that you have as you migrate okay so uh, that is the demonstrator uh, part of it it has got traditional part as well as advanced part and completely advanced and completely traditional all these combinations can be up there and tested demonstrated and then it can be deployed so that way this is a different type of facility it is not a all local smart factory you should better call it a smart factory you know facility kind of thing okay and design innovation center is another thing it is where there's the bottlenecks in the design education by training the trainers right and it is sort of a hub and spoke kind of thing such that we our effort is multiplied over uh, time Yeah, DIC design. Uh, the this is the uh, that is NDIN, and this is Design Innovation Center, right? So this is also uh, this is uh, government funded. All are uh, the actually all of these are government funded. All four are government funded. Yeah, so there uh, it is like uh, the uh, train the trainers means uh, we adopt say about when it started we adopted uh, ten different uh, universities. their people uh, come here we run some workshop and then they go back and run their workshop for others okay that type of uh, approach here so within the same uh, framework so one is a startup which is so cp dev cp dev focused specifically on medtech but this is open to all kinds of uh, design products as well So there are multiple incubation possibilities in IS. So besides these two, in fact, we also have the FSID and other. Yeah. So, uh, like, so basically, it is a part of a, big, a bigger ecosystem. And uh, inter important. Why you mentioned here is that this is, in some sense, a, a, a initiative that started uh, some time back, and it is still continuing. Okay. and in some sense that was a initiative taken uh, to scale up the department because uh, for sustaining for 10 15 years and remaining at the same level is to did not like it okay so we are about to get closed okay yeah so then you had to take some uh, extra effort to prove our both viability and uh, importance okay so with that initiative you know finally it worked out better for us and uh, these are the two flagship conferences out of which this already uh, ninth one is over every biennial uh, conference uh, every even years we have the uh, every odd years 
we have ICARD, and every even years we have Industry 4 uh, conference. This is a very well attended, very high uh, uh, this year, quality. This year, the numbers are already beyond 1200 abstracts. Just we close the abstracts, 1200 abstracts have come just this year. Okay, so it is very well attended and uh, uh, nice conference. Uh, uh, actually, another conference we started on um, PLM, product lifecycle management, in 2006, and now it has gone uh, that big and is not, uh, you know, it is roaming all over the world now. Okay, uh, we started two conferences, one called PLMSS, that is still anchored in Bangalore, but other one is PLMS, uh, PLM conference that has now uh, you know, gone all over. I don't know why that is not mentioned. That should be mentioned. Yeah, PLM conference. Okay, so that is overall that uh, uh, at which uh, types of things uh, which uh, we are at, right? I'll hand over to Vishal to proceed with the today's agenda. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, President. So this also, uh, I mean, the idea of repeating this every time of the students might be wondering why do we do it every time, but we always have new guests and also new people join online every now and then. Also good for a good reminder every month, no? so it's good to sort of get reinforced what, what we are doing, why we are doing. All right, so with that, again, agenda is known to you. Uh, the panelists, you already know, so I'll immediately jump into the talks. Uh, you already know what uh, we do. So the first sessions will be a 10 minute talk by each of the panelists, then we'll go, go move into uh, uh, we'll take a few questions at this point, then we'll move into the panel discussion, which uh, be largely sort of moderated by me. I'll ask questions uh, and then we can again go back to some discussions and then hopefully some of the alumni, if they join, at least I noticed one has joined, so great. And uh, then they can talk us and tell us about what their journey has been since they have graduated. Right, so and uh, so this is 18th batch. 18th, 18th batch, 18th event, 18th batch. Ah, now we are asking, putting me on spot. <laughs> and now I, I just go and look at which one is the 18th one, send an email. Yeah, I have to check. I'll, I'll get back on that. See. Right. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, passing out here. Passing out here will be counted. Yeah. So uh, with that, uh, I'll um, typically we start with the uh, speakers online because that's easier to manage. So I'll ask Anas to start with his talk. Uh, so Anas, if you could share your slides and in the meanwhile, I introduce uh, Anas in um, brief. Uh, so Anas is a user experience and graphic designer from Kochi, uh, now stationed in Perth, Australia. He has over 20 years of experience in the IT industry. Uh, he's an expert in creating delightful experiences for users of digital products and services. He loves to write about design and has experience in building and mentoring design teams. Uh, and of course, it's a pleasure also that he is an MDIS graduate from CPDM. And before that, he had done a bachelor's in engineering in electronics and communication. Uh, he also writes about design on his blog, designpulley.com. Uh, and uh, I'll encourage you to go there and check uh, his blogs. The most recent one was, or I don't know, what the, I won't say most recent one. Maybe he's written more about, but at least... Uh, he was also the winner of our recent most competition, which was rebranding of CPDM when we became DM. So the department has now not CPDM, it's design and manufacturing. And we ran a competition amongst our students and alumni, and he won the, and I believe he's going to talk about that as well. So all yours, sir, Anas. 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Vishal. So uh, of course, I know that uh, you can hear me, right, and uh, see my slides as well. Uh, Professor Vishal, uh, are you able to see the slides and uh, hear me? Hello, Professor uh, Vishal, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Please go oh, ahead. Oh, OK. OK. So you are also able to see the slides, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, very good. OK. Uh, so thank you, Professor Vishal, uh, for the introduction. And uh, uh, dear professors, uh, so today's uh, panel. Yeah, just, Anas, just hold for a minute. Uh, yeah. No worries. 
Right. This is our uh, first uh, this meeting after we got uh, the formally uh, declared as a department. It is no longer a center and uh, we got declared as a department and this is the first event after that. I thought we'll uh, make it as a point that uh, CPDM, two things changed, that C became department and P has been dropped. And this is not to mean that we no longer do product design. It only means that we also do other things. <laughs> this is, yeah, so that is, uh, yeah. Okay, so because, because, before, because of that, I thought before he starts, right? This is important that what was the motivation for this rebranding? Okay, and why it is so special is that such a simple thing, what we think from uh, institute perspective, you know, this takes a long route to uh, convincing people. And finally, the process of getting approved and when you see in black and white, then you know we are. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, please go ahead, Anas. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, uh, dear professors, uh, so today's panelists, uh, uh, Dr. Nitya, uh, Reshma, uh, my dear friend and senior, uh, Vishal Hemant, um, my friends and uh, dear students. First of all, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, logo design today. So, that is also a new thing for me. Usually, I always talk about UX design. Um, I believe today, Vishal Hemant is going to talk about uh, UX design. So, today, let me try to talk a little bit about logo designs and stuff. Uh, the title of my presentation is From Doodles to Dollars. Uh, till last year, it was From Doodles to Rupees. Uh, since uh, right now I am in uh, Perth, uh, I have changed the title to Dollars, actually. Um, yeah, and uh, one more thing, I have received a lot of uh, encouraging words from uh, uh, students and uh, faculty, professors, alumni, a lot of people regarding the new uh, logo of uh, DM. So thank you very much for that. I also received uh, some criticism uh, as well as some uh, uh, some improvement points as well. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, uh, sending all these emails and messages to me. So uh, let us let us begin. Um, when does a hobby become not a hobby? Uh, that is the time when people basically reach out to you and they start paying for your hobby, right? So that is that is what actually happened in my case. My core expertise uh, is always uh, UX design, but I started designing uh, logo as a hobby. And uh, yeah, so uh, I would like to talk a little bit about my journey and then I will also talk about my logo design process. And I will also, also share a couple of resources for you. So that is that is today's agenda. Uh, by the way, let me just start the stopwatch so that I will I'll be able to finish in time. Okay, yeah. So 2008, uh, I joined uh, uh, CPDM, our uh, our department in 2008, and at that point in time, I was just uh, doing some very basic logo designs for uh, some of my friends and all. So what you are seeing on the screen on the left hand side is my uh, one of the earliest uh, designs I have done in in the year 2008. In 2009, I got a chance to design the number cycle logo. Uh, so some of you might be remembering this logo in our campus. So that was, uh, uh, I, I will say like that, that is the first time I received some widespread, uh, uh, let us say, uh, recognition, right, for this particular logo design. It was number cycle. And uh, as you know, in 2024, uh, this year, uh, I got an opportunity to redesign our department uh, logo as well. So yeah, it has, in, it has been an incredible trend. So how did I start? I always started by designing logos for myself. <laughs> I have uh, some, uh, at least a dozen websites and blogs and stuff like that. So I always uh, wanted to design a lot of logos for myself. So I started designing like that. So I uh, just used uh, Photoshop and Illustrator to come up with some ideas and then design stuff for me. And after that, uh, of course, uh, I started designing logos for my family. So now my wife is having a logo. My uh, two daughters, they are also having their own logos. <laughs> as well as websites, by the way. So, uh, so this was the first step. I designed something for me, and then I started designing for my family. And then, of course, you know how it goes, right? So I started designing for my friends. So uh, that was also something like interesting. Um, uh, they usually come up with... Uh, 
some problem statement or design statement and then i will try to uh, doodle a lot of stuff and then try to digitize uh, uh, logos and then started giving to them so that was that thing but there is one thing right there is something known as imposter i think syndrome or something so i always wanted to get some kind of confirmation about my logo design skills and because of that i started uh, uh, taking part in competitions in logo design competitions so you know what i started winning logo design competitions so in 2008 uh, the state of kerala uh, the it mission in kerala they conducted one logo design competition for one of the it uh, technology parks in uh, kolikod uh, which is not a cyber park so i took part in that contest and uh, i won that particular thing in 2008 then uh, uh, it was in 2022 right 2022 a uh, couple of years uh, uh, before uh, the bihar government did a contest all india contest about a self help group designing a logo for that and i also took part in that competition and i was also fortunate to win that particular thing and of course uh, this year right uh, i also won uh, our department's competition as well so this basically gives me a, 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 a moral boost as well as uh, some kind of a confidence right in pursuing this particular um, line of work and i started uh, also designing logos for non profits so the first one that you are going or the left left most logo that you are seeing on the screen was for uh, the rotary club of kochi so i uh, designed a logo for them some four years ago and uh, uh, this is actually a fundraiser event a marathon that is happening in the city of kochi uh, so whenever this is happening i mean you will probably see my logo plastered across the city in um, hoardings and uh, posters and all those kinds of stuff so that was actually quite interesting so i started designing for non profits as well and you know what what happened slowly i started getting customers uh, paying customers i will say uh, some customers uh, came to me by uh, let us say recommendation from some of my friends and then there was a customer who actually saw one of my blog about a design uh, a logo design and then they actually wanted to reach out to me and then there was also a customer who just searched for logo design or good design or good designer in google and uh, they found me by the way i also own this particular website bestdesignernear.us <laughs> if you if you search for this particular thing i mean definitely you will be redirected to my website so i have done these kinds of seo things as well search engine optimization things as well for uh, this particular thing anyway i have i have designed logos for a uh, lot of uh, entities in different uh, industry segments and different fields uh, non profits public service fitness hospitality construction and all so it was actually a quite interesting journey and uh, if you are uh, visiting ansfx.com uh, that is my logo portfolio website you will be able to see something like close to around 75 logos and uh, that is that is roughly like five logos per year uh, for the past 15 years or so uh, which i think is a good number i will i will say because this is a hobby right for me and uh, as professor vishal mentioned uh, this is my blog on design designpilot.com so i always try to write about uh, behind the scenes right the thought process the design decisions that i i am doing whenever i am doing a design right it can be a logo design it can be a poster design and all those kinds of stuff so this is my website uh, designpilot.com i always write about this one of course you'll be able to see the details about our department's uh, logo design here as well and uh, now let us start a little bit of a boring stuff okay um, so there is there is this particular quote that i found which was interesting like i mean a logo is always an identity it shouldn't explain uh, about the business so uh, the example that uh, these people right the future that they are mentioning is about apple um, apple computers there is no particular relation between let us say apple the fruit and computer but that is their identity right so from an identity perspective that is a good logo but are they talking about the business probably may not right and uh, one more thing i would like to clarify is like i mean whenever um, we are saying logo design logo design and all those kinds of stuff there are uh, separate terms for uh, let us say the elements of a logo the pictorial symbol that you generally see that is the logo actually which is generally used for let us say fab icons and all those kinds of stuff in web and uh, sometimes 
you may have to design something known as a monogram, which is basically a letter mark, like one, two or more letters. Uh, so in our case, in our department's case, it is a DM IIC. So that is the letter mark uh, that uh, I have designed. These letter mark usually uh, appear on merchandise and all those kinds of stuff. Then there is uh, something known as a word mark or the logo type that basically spells out the entire name right, uh, of our department. So that is generally used on all the official documents. And uh, there is also um, a layout difference between different types of logos. So as you can see, right, uh, there is something known as a stacked logo type, uh, which is uh, basically used on mobile applications and all, where the, um, let's say, we have more vertical space compared to the horizontal space. And uh, there is also something known as a linear logo type, where, uh, which usually appears on website headers or footers and those kinds of places. So these are some of the elements of a logo. And I would like to just mention about uh, the logo design process, how it starts, right? So uh, I follow something known as 6D methodology, 6Ds um, representing the different process of uh, logo designs. It always starts with discovery. Um, the discovery stage um, involves research on some of the uh, competitors and probably the industry vertical uh, that uh, the uh, business is coming from or the client is coming from. So that is the discovery phase. Then uh, I'll be doing something known as uh, the define phase where I try to find, let us say, three common or three maximum of three designs or three options for the logo design work. And then I start doodling right on paper. And it used to be pen and paper. Now it is uh, mostly iPad, uh, Apple Pencil and uh, an app known as Good Notes. And uh, then after that, what usually happens is like I started developing that one in Photoshop. So basically, most of the time it is raster graphics. And uh, I try to show these three options with the client and uh, make them understand, okay, this is the process and this is the idea behind, let us say, these three options. Please pick one. So when they are picking one of the options, then I worry about colors and layouts and all those kinds of stuff. And uh, if they are approving that particular version, that is the time when I do the actual design. That is the time when I'll be converting the logo into vector graphics, right? So um, I, of course, you have to typically use Adobe Illustrator, but most of the time I'll be using Adobe Photoshop, Photoshop itself using pen tool and shape layers. That's what I generally do. And then fi finally, I deliver the files. Um, very recently, um, a couple of startups uh, started asking me about uh, the logo guidelines as well. So now I prepare logo guidelines and uh, using Adobe Illustrator and then deliver that as well. So I have done the same thing for our department. So um, uh, Professor Vishal asked for the logo guidelines and then uh, I designed uh, one for them. Yeah, so. Um, since we, uh, we are running out of time, I just want to touch upon a couple of things, that's all. Um, discovery phase, I have an online Google form, uh, so I always ask people to fill that uh, form. Then whenever uh, um, I am doing research, right, I generally go to, let us say, Google image search, logopon.com, stock image websites and all. Nowadays, uh, we can have, there are there are a lot of websites um, uh, using AI, right, artificial intelligence to generate uh, logos and all. So I usually go there and then just uh, try to search for the particular industry or even the name and then see what they are coming up with, right? So that that I always do. Um, you can see some of uh, uh, my studies on some of the existing designs done by or some of the popular brands in uh, my website, kickdo.com. Um, the synthesis part, right? The definition part. So I always use FigJam uh, from Figma for this particular exercise. It's basically about finding, uh, let us say, the secret source, right? The three directions, the design directions that I want to build on top of that. And then I start doing on paper. So these are some of the photographs of and scanned copies of some of the um, logo doodles that I have done. And then I create a presentation uh, 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 deck, right, for the customer. And then I deliver the logo uh, mockups as well. So as you can see on the screen, right, it's a dark background uh, colored logo, light background colored logo, then uh, grayscale logo on different backgrounds. Then uh, as I mentioned earlier, right, linear version of the logo, stacked version of the logo, then what is the inspiration for designing that particular, uh, let us say, logo. 
then what is the logic behind or what are the design decisions that i have taken behind that one and then lot of uh, mock ups so mock ups really help in setting a design because this is the time when client will be looking at this one and then uh, he or she will be understanding okay this, this is how the logo is basically applied on top of uh, let us say packaging or signage and all those kinds of stuff and if there is time right most of the time i also also try to deliver an animation as well so for the jiva brand uh, uh, this is the uh, bihar government's competition right i mentioned earlier which i won in 2022 i created uh, this particular video in um, microsoft powerpoint so animations always uh, sell your logos right i mean whenever uh, you are creating a logo always try to see if you can come up with some simple animations and all those kinds of things uh, some of the animations uh, or logo animations that i have done is available in youtube uh, my channel at designpuli.com uh, and if i am doing more than one logo then i will definitely um, include one slide where i will be showing all the logo options right for the customer and uh, colors most of you know right i mean how to pick colors and all those kinds of things for me i always uh, turn to adobe color website color.adobe.com i also sometimes i pick colors from the product itself so this is one example very recently where, where i tried to create a logo for a grass mat i got a photo from the customer and then i just picked some of the colors from that one and then made the logo and uh, as you know right i mean whenever people are coming up with uh, this particular question of how do you um, let us say uh, connect different colors right to the logo and all there are a lot of examples that we have so the combination of black and yellow is caterpillar commonwealth bank the combination of let us say green yellow orange and all microsoft logo we have slack logo we have so i always refer these kinds of logos and then come up with my own uh, uh, style and uh, yeah this is just a, a a brief slide that actually shows the brand guideline for our department uh, dm iic so i am basically showing the color logo the logo in black then the reversed color logo what will the logo look like when the logo is applied on a dark surface or black surface and then the white option as well as let us say uh, the guidelines regarding colors and typography and also this is how um, something uh, like a brand design right, or guideline will be delivered and uh, i would like to conclude with this particular uh, <laughs> quote secretly nobody wants a new logo they just want their old logo back so this particular quote is applicable only for um, logo redesigns and probably you will know right i mean uh, it's the same principle that i also followed um so before uh, closing i would like to just uh, give shout out to a couple of uh, people so daviddiary.com if you are interested in let us say logo design and all uh, david diary publishes a lot of uh, uh, online uh, resources for people similarly krisdo uh, his uh, the future youtube channel as well as blind.com big spaceship uh, used to have a very extensive uh, i will say resource on logo design very recently i think two weeks back they revamped their website into spaceship.com so these things are not up right now i have emailed them let us see what happens so that's all then thank you very much uh, uh, if you have any questions probably i can answer later or you can uh, connect with me Uh, via linkedin as well so the qr code that you are seeing on the screen if you scan you will directly going to my linkedin account so thank you very much uh, for listening um, thank you very much uh, professor vishal yeah thanks and uh, this wonderful uh, hang around because of course you still have to be on the panel and then of course you have to take questions yeah. later yeah, yeah so with that uh, we'll park the questions for later so i'll move on to the next speaker yeah uh, i'll invite dr nitya venkat raman to present her talk uh, and uh, while i I'll, okay let me do one thing at a time otherwise i'll mess it up again so please come okay i'm hoping that i'm sharing the right thing
this is the one no this is the one is it no this is my okay sorry i clicked the wrong thing yeah okay let me find it one second just give me a moment Yeah, there was a okay. I have to also put it here. So. That's the one. Right before you start, just let me introduce you. Just okay. I'll keep the introduction brief. So, uh, Dr. Nitya Venkatraman is a doctorate in philosophy in management from Christ University, Bangalore. A master in philosophy from Christ, a master's degree from uh, NIFT, and a PG diploma in knitwear design. From New Delhi, uh, and a bachelor's in science from Lady Irwin College, Delhi University. Uh, she is currently an associate professor in NIFT, uh, Bangalore, uh, and her uh, research interests uh, look into design process, design thinking, trend research and forecasting, behavioral economics, product development, and of course, I can read on, but I would rather have her talk, uh, give the talk. So, thank you so much, Professor, and uh, thank you everyone for. Uh, for being here, and I think a wonderful presentation from uh, Anis. I really enjoyed uh, the entire logo journey. I come from a slightly different area of design, so I have uh, I've been learning the design for fashion, purely because of commercial purposes. It sells roti kapra makan, so fashion never goes out of fashion. And uh, ever since uh, the time I was a student at NAFT, I learned fashion to sell. Which essentially means how do you design clothes so that they sell in the market? So whether it's picking the right color or the fabric, the focus uh, has been on how do you sell fashion and sell it very fast. So we have also seen the period of fast fashion, you know, uh, fashion moving uh, at the breakneck speed, trends coming in, trends going out. So it has always been about all facets of fashion, right from clothing, garments, accessories. Websites, uh, logo design again, probably anything and everything that I was dealing with fashion was about how to make it sell and sell well, make profits, right? So uh, when I moved away from uh, from the industry, which I was working in for a long time in the retail industry and moved into ac academics, I realized this is exactly what I'm teaching my student as well. So how will you not sell? How will this sell? You're not going to make any profit. I mean, to get down to brass tacks, you know, so make things so that they sell, right? So the whole, whole focus was on selling. The whole focus was on making sure that it hits the market. Then, um, I won't call it an epiphany. Something happened. I happened to see, and I'll probably share it in this room. I happened to see one, uh, a movie, uh, which was called uh, The Real Cost. And uh, this movie was played in accident. I mean, it was played uh, with a good intent. I walked in, in accident, into the auditorium where it was played. And I know faculty and Professor Vishal will agree that all of us are most of the time all over the place. You hardly know where you are. So I just walked into the auditorium by mistake, and I sat there for one and a half hours watching a movie ripped apart fashion. So it talked about the Black Friday sale about the fact that your wardrobe is full of stuff that you don't need. It talked about the Bangladesh, uh, you know, the Rahat Plaza disaster. It talked about the, uh, the, the pathetic workshops in which our operators work. And uh, I, I started questioning my career decision. Am I in the right place? You know, so there is this guilt that immediately stuck me saying, am I, what am I doing? You know, why am I making this? Uh, product sell, which probably no one needs to. And then to top it all, I had this entire guilt being re reinforced within me saying, since I was working in the retail, I knew the numbers, and I'll share it with you in a while. Uh, I knew the numbers of clothing A that we buy and we don't use. And if you don't believe me, just go back and check your wardrobes today. B, clothing that are sitting in the shelves, in the retail shelves, which go into what we call a liquidation dump. We don't even know where it goes once the season gets over and where it ends. So this was uh, this was what I call the guilt of being in fashion. 
So I had two options. I could quit. But uh, of course, that's not I mean, you move from the, the, the you know, fire to the frying, frying pan. So we are in, in, in a place where you sell for consumption. I had been designing for consumption all the way. And the aftermath, uh, the glorious aftermath for designing for consumption, there are short stats that I would probably want to share with you. And this is something that I also took away from the fact that I was working very closely in the, with the industry. 30% uh, of apparel items which you make are not sold. What you see in the stores, 30% of them remain unsold, dead inventory. Nearly 50 billion USD a year is what it costs us. 170 million worth of clothing ends up as landfills, the picture that you just saw. So let's not even get into the staggering amount of ecological waste that we are leading this into. 2018, I think some of you might be knowing about this, Burberry actually revealed 37 million dollars worth clothing that it set on fire because they didn't know where to dump and they were scared that others would pick, pick up the same design and work on it and of course Burberry is Burberry. So they actually had to incinerate them. Then of course we have so much of greenhouse gas emissions which talk about how much we spent just in dispersing excess inventory. So you kind of agree with me, right? I was I was in a state where I realized that I'm not really in a very pleasant situation of selling clothes. So this actually, uh, you know, kind of started uh, having, I, ha I started having this conversation in my head saying, can the amount, the 30% that we're talking about in a store, which is not really sold, can this go back to the cycle? We can't do much, right? It's already in the store. A, the idea is that you don't make them, but of course those kind of models are already there. So what do we do with this, with the merchandise, the unsold merchandise in the store, which just gets lost in inventory somewhere. So what do we do and how do we reposition them in the market? So a lot of studies actually goes for products where you break apart a product and you make it into a new product. Unfortunately, not with clothing. So if you've seen a jacket, you've seen a jacket. There is upcycling, but it's never done at store level. So we do have it, you know, we have, okay, I had a pair of jeans, I, I, I kind of cut it and I made it into a bag and I'm wearing that bag. But that's just a purely personal second-hand use of clothing that you're doing. What about the industrial, retail, commercial space, which is actually the villain in the piece? So we wanted to see whether there's an aesthetic appearance change and can you reposition them as a new SKU? So this... Is easier said than done. It had a three pronged uh, challenge. We had to look at the marketing area, of course. Also, the behavioral science area, because the moment you tell someone saying, Oh, this is fashion, but sorry, it didn't sell. I've kind of remade it and it's there in the store. Will you buy it? And I'm going to charge you a premium. Right. So it kind of sounds very, very, you know, not not very right. You know, you don't really expect the customer to fall for that kind of a situation. So there was a lot of behavioral science aspect in terms of do we look back? Do we tell them that this is a product which was not sold and then it's come back to you? Or do we just sell it and, you know, just put it as a new, new product? What do we do? Is there a reference price? So we also had to think a lot in terms of, you know, how, how we position it here. And of course, the social aspect. How does the customer wear it? What does he feel? Does he feel that he's innovative? Does he feel that, you know, does he feel that, you know, he's doing a favor to the society? Does he feel, oh, I am this arrived person because I've actually used a redone product or does he not feel anything at all? So what does it happen? I mean, how does this work? So for running this experiment, uh, I actually had to pull out what we call as end of life cycle products. Uh, so I uh, kind of zeroed in on Levi's, which was doing a project with NIFT at that point of time. They were happy to give away products, to be very honest. So these were some of the products that they gave. To me, this happened in spring, summer 17. And uh, these were picked up from the warehouse, uh, single pieces that they gave it uh, gave to us. They were unsold even after deep discounts. That means they were products which were just lying there. Nobody wanted them. Yes. It's end of sale, but it's end of life, life cycle as far as the retail uh, process is concerned. So basically, it's gone through a, a, a sale cycle where it's sold at full price, come back to discount, and then end of retail life cycle. Not end of life cycle of the product use. Um, so some products, basic jeans, 501, uh, shorts, you know, polo PK t-shirts, 
um, we had a few more. Yeah, next slide. So we had kids, uh, you know, jumpers and stuff like that. So uh, most of them uh, were stuff uh, that you generally see, which are core products that we have in the fashion line. So uh, the experiment was to actually take the product, deconstruct it, break it apart through the seams. So the one on the right uh, that you see is the original uh, jean that uh, was one of the products that we worked with. This is a men's jeans. So we uh, opened it up at the seams and then tried and put, put it together so that A, it looks visually very different from the same product. B, we use all the components and don't add anything. And in that whole uh, you know, rigmarole of this adjustment, there was a size change which had to happen because my seam allowances were going off. So it, from a men's jean, it had to become a ladies uh, you know, uh, a jacket. But uh, yeah, I mean, at this point, we didn't have unisex so much happening at that time. This is what uh, we drape. We took the T-shirt, we opened it up again, draped it to see if it can be made into anything else. So that's the deconstructed ladies top. Um, that's a shorts, uh, basic men's shorts. Uh, this was the most difficult part of it, trying to drape it into into something which you know doesn't show its shorts as well. So it got converted. I'll show you the avatars that it became later. This is a polo PK t-shirt, which we tried making into a skirt. Uh, and this is what was the uh, men's jeans, which became a jacket, a long jacket, a short crop in the front and the long jacket at the back. And uh, uh, this uh, kind of was the redone product that we actually have. I'll have one more to share. This is the shorts. So that's the original shot, and this is the shrug that it became. Now, this is all nice to sit and do in a pattern making lab and try and see how it changes, but at the end of the day, will it sell? So we had to run this experiment amongst um, students. So I had a line of hypothesis to check, and I'll not run through the entire statistical uh, thing because, of course, it gets boring, and I don't think, you know, within the purview of time. But I'll only share a few findings which were interesting. Uh, so, in terms of innovativeness, this is the first thing that took completely by surprise. I expected that people uh, who are not very, what we generally use as a fashion forward person, to pick this up. Okay, because they distinctly look very different from what a general t-shirt or a general uh, pair of jeans might be looking at. So, I had a scale, a very well-defined scale, which measured the innovativeness quotient of a consumer. What was surprising was the fact that this had no correlation to actually picking up the product. So the people or the fashion consumer who's, who has actually rated himself or herself a very, very low in the innovative scale also picked up the product equally as much as the person who rated himself high. So the innovativeness is something uh, which kind of was no, no longer a factor here. Second, and this kind of went a little bit into detail. Again, I'm just touching the periphery of this. How does this uh, affect my price? You know, so my internal reference price. Am I supposed to lower the price, which doesn't work, because obviously there's a lot of cost implications in the entire process. But if I upcharge it, will it work? Thankfully, it did. The average market price, average fair price was reported higher. What was interesting and which I, I wanted to see was whether there should be a previous price reference or not. So whether the attitude that the person had to this particular garment with a previous reference, saying this is what it was, this was the original product, now I'm pricing you at this price, will it work? Uh, without a previous uh, price difference and with a previous uh, price different, uh, it was only in the case where I'm selling it online. That means if they only had a visual interaction, there was a significant difference. When I sold it with the physical interaction, that means the person had actually a chance to touch, feel, wear, the whole idea of having a previous reference was no longer there. So that was about the internal reference price. And the third, how do I sell it? So uh, basically, of course, this was not really surprising. It sold better when the customers had a chance to interact with the garment, feel, touch, wear. And uh, obviously, it gave them a better sense of quality, the uh, better sense of understanding what the product is. So uh, that obviously, I mean, gave me the chance also to say that it can become an experiential takeaway in a store where you are selling it in an offline pro product. 
rather than just uh, selling them online. So obviously, a physical store format worked much better there. So this was again something which kind of uh, was an interesting insight here. Um, but this is again just just a uh, you know scratching the surface. There's a long way ahead. Uh, you know, if it really has to see fruition, we have to look at price framing. Uh, price framing. Uh, you know, how does how do you really price it? How do you put the price point across, and how do you actually put the price tag on it to reflect what the prices can be? Designing for deconstruction. So, can you make the product initially in such a manner that it's easier for you to make? Uh, a new product out of it. So while you design, you design with a deconstruction at the end of the product uh, retail life cycle. Uh, behavioral aspects. I mean, how much are people ready to buy leftover merchandise? Fashion consumers can be really finicky, and uh, you know some of them might actually have the situation saying, "Oh, you're selling me, you know, seasonal stock, and you're trying to give me, you know, so make me buy more for it." So how much is the leftover merchandise? You know, how much openness is there? Price premium acceptance, whether that's going to happen, and whether the whole concept of sustainability will sell for a premium. So, if we say that, listen, this is actually a product which could have gone to the landfill, and now you have it, and you are paying a premium, will that work? You know, so a lot of times it does, unfortunately, but that's how we still sell sustainability. So, does it work that way? So, probably the premium is not on the product, but the premium is on sustainability. And then, of course, the toughest part of it, the production logistics, the cost of deconstruction in itself, which a lot of people told me that you know that's probably the most difficult part. But considering the width of our production that we have in our units, I don't think it's too difficult to manage. Just have to look at the reverse logistics situation and have a dedicated line to work on it. It may work, but these are the still the areas which which kind of need uh, work on. But this is kind of been my pet project. And this is something that I really had been wanting to do, and uh, you know, kind of try and see how best we can reduce the load that the fashion industry, you know, gives or keeps on Earth. So uh, something that can probably help at least a part of it work. So um, towards more conscious designing. Thank you so much. Uh, any any questions? Any insights? Actually, anything that anyone would want to share on this? I would be more than happy to take later once we finish the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. That was a wonderful, uh, wonderful talk. Uh, we had two great stories, and since we hear stories and that's what we do, we can't have somebody not talking about stories. So, with that, I'll introduce our next speaker. So we have Resh, uh, Reshma Tonse. She is a context architect and co-founder of 1001 Stories. So we, I got it right. So I was wondering whether you'd say 1001 Stories or Okay, so 1001 Stories. So Reshma Tonse is a co-founder at 1001 Stories. Her work is driven by social norms, social psychology, and a keen interest in folklore, culture design, and behavioral sciences. Her work has helped HDFC, ACO, Scalar, Samsung, Mondelez, Swiggy, ITC, Mars, and the list goes on. And my phone just sits into its own blank mode. So, all right. So, and uh, basically, is trying to understand, uh, helping them understand and design for consumers to better increase customer engagement and revenue. So with that, I'll invite Reshma to give a talk. While that is going on. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Oh damn! Sorry. Uh, can can you can you hear me? Can you hear me online? Anas, are we audible? Or others? I can, I, can, I can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, all right. Super. Thank you. Um, I don't have a presentation. But um, there is something I'd like to show you. So Prakash, you're going to help me with that. Um, there's some. Uh, uh, Dr. Nitya was talking about something beautiful, and I'll, I want to touch on that again in a bit, actually. Um, but I want to start with something that we, when we started this entire thing, we were talking about how there are so many different interpretations of design. And uh, I'm so glad that that was addressed because I think each and every one of us is talking about a different perspective on design and a different way that we're looking at it. 
um for me the story is about 20 years old and uh, 20 years back i was a bachcha on the field and um, we were um something extremely mundane we were we were we were researching paint literally paint right we were out on the and we were, and you're trying to figure everything from who is the paint consumer to how are they consuming it to how do they see it to forecasting to what's the future etc etc 20 years back this is when paint was in hardware stores that sold plumbing gear and electrical um stuff paint yeah absolutely right so um um we went on field and i remember so it was just, it was very really interesting we went to a bunch of houses in different areas around the country some of them were tiny they were in very small areas there were some of them were slums um some were in jols and in different parts not necessarily all in cities some were about 120 square feet is about the entire household and um the walls were all red and yellow and green and blue and if they can't decide why to decide there are four walls this one is blue that one is green right you can do whatever you want so so this is happening and then you're just looking at everything every house is shocking you right and um, you ask them why why you <laughs> why <laughs> right and um, i still remember some of these answers and remember one of them he said mai bahut dildar insaan hu theek hai mai bahut dildar pura ghar bhi hoga na dildar and my house is my personality does not reflect that why not kar ha baat to sahi hai correct um what am i ah wait no kaun hai apni okay so um cut to we've gone to some 3 4 5 bhk homes huge ones right you hear me one red wall one orange wall there green here blue it's all happening and then you ask them why madam right and then they go it's my house and my personality must you know showcase in my home my my home must be an expression of who i am and uh, then comes the middle right the big vast great indian middle everyone white all the houses are white their beige today there is a grey there was no grey then there was only a beige uh, there was a cream indian dad favorite color right and uh... <laughs> correct <laughs> and then you ask them why lekin matlab kyun aapko pata hai na there is style there are all this going on why are you not doing it and they go nahi wo log dekhenge bolenge itna jata kyu hai right and i remember that i was uh, this was one of the first things that for me uh, it was a learning again i'm saying as a bachcha and I, i had the privilege of learning from some fantastic people who were looking for i mean a paint company may have given you money but they don't think that's the product you know so um, you you get on and we start listening and and this first time we realized that the, the the product was not paint the product was social signaling right um what we we have to realize that the field was open right um sun you come back and you realize you not you not going to design for um a can of latex y- you have an opportunity to design retail and and that is one of the things that actually uh, took us from the hardware store where only the painter or the plumber went and um, we said we needed to design the new consumer not paint a new consumer itself you need to design new stores and you took them out and paint became retail uh, it came out of some version of sp and avenue road and uh, took up a kurmangla took up a 100 feet road took up a 60 feet road took that retail space started making paint pots started explaining sampling for 20 years and today we are at a peak where you've nurtured the obsession with uh, decor i i get the the anger but yeah um and and that is really what you ended up designing right 20 years back and then i've had i um it was it was amazing because i've been blown multiple times 
uh, through uh, these years to to work with so many different services policy um brands um and understand that at the end of the day so my perspective on design has changed uh since then which led to realizing that you're never actually ever designing a product or always designing context you're always designing the context for um something to be seen something to be created something to be used and uh, we took a bunch of years and we sat together and we said acha agar design context bana rahe hai to context ko design kaise karte hain right and uh, there was lots of experimenting there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of failing and uh, guided by the different disciplines that study and look at and model human behavior um we we were able to understand broadly and this is not context is literally everything right it's everything that surrounds you the, um, sudhir kakar talks about this beautiful thing where he where he speaks about if you look at a can you guys close your eyes it doesn't matter religion really doesn't matter here but can you can you imagine the picture of krishna if you imagine the picture of krishna what do you see ओपन द फील्ड जो भी याद है राइट आई मीन सुधर सो मेरे देर इज देर इज अ काउ देर इज yeah there are, there's a cow there is in lot of cases they it, if we were in another part of this country they wouldn't the first answer would be raja right <laughs> i know where is <laughs> there is this diversity inclusion so there but anyway yeah. but um and that is the that's the beauty of looking at it. it's also culturally the way that indians build context but but if you remove radha if you remove basuri if you remove more punk if you remove cow if you remove everything is he krishna <laughs> he became bigger bloom and much later who evolution but uh, no um yeah so the, the entire thing is that i mean at the end of the day we keep looking at what hits us in the foreground but it is the background that defines what that's so that foreground is going to be and what it's going to stand out as can you define that can you define that background can you design that background so that you see only one foreground that's possible of course that's what design is right um absolutely there is so when you look at it from there is a there's a long conversation there but um in an indian context you cannot make there is no mona lisa it is in a western context that a mona lisa can be created where if you look at rumo mona lisa background hai nahi there is nothing there is no if you look at it there's no it looks like it might be a ravine it's not it may be hills it's not it's just some colors blending it's it's there is no object she is the only object everything is created for her but sure i don't know this literature but <laughs> <laughs> constructing context and again like i was saying it is everything right we don't we can't define everything everything will not sit in the framework some things some few things that you can do see are our social norms and so this is there is social norms there is collective memory linguistics what is the language that we use to talk about things and that in itself can define context um in one of the cases i remember this time when uh, uh we talk about this actually you quit but there's this there was a time when we had gone to a couple of neighborhoods um in bangalore uh, it did okay then so in in bangalore and we were talking to a bunch of people who
we'll leave it to some investigative journalism. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we went and. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, no, yeah, what are you doing? Yes, yes. Also, there are people potentially on YouTube, so we have to. Oh. Manage. We'll manage. So, um, so we we went out to a bunch of people, and we were trying to we were working on something. We we're trying to figure how do you start uh, community composting in a bunch of places and um, segregation of waste. It was really interesting because in the mornings when we go and speak to people and we talk to them about it and you know segregation. We were sitting in Bangalore. Half the people have come back from US. They were segregating there. And uh, when you ask them over here to segregate, they say the same thing. How the mom go? It's very good. It's needed also because look at the amount. Look at landfill, dirty garbage. All of these things to speak about. And all the words that would come would be dirt, garbage. Um, Bangalore, once green city, garbage city, they would talk about all of these things. And that was always what would come when we'd speak to these people. When we realized something's off. Everyone knows everything, right? Why are they not? What's going wrong? We realized maybe we're not asking them at the right time. And so we came back. We came back at six in the morning. We came back at six in the morning. We went on up to 9 30, 10 o'clock um, on our rounds. And Bangalore looked different. Right? At this point, then Bangalore looks different. Um, on YouTube, there is Suprabhata playing. Right? Uh, there are people who put water out and they've just washed the gates. They're putting Rangoli. Um, there are uh, parties who are generally walking around, taking flowers, or talking to each other in these residential areas. And now we ask them, what about, you know, what's happening? Do you do segregation? What, what is, what is the, con what is, you know, what happens to the garbage? And suddenly it's exact same questions, the same people. And the conversation suddenly became about purity. About my home. About what a woman does in the morning. It became about the fact that mornings are pure. Mornings are sacred. This is the time when you're supposed to clean, remove the yesterday. This is a new start, right? And now here, at this point, she's not even gone to the kitchen yet. She has to take a bath. She has to finish all of this. Then she'll go to the kitchen. She'll cook. Before that, the maid has to come take out yesterday's trash. All that needs to go. At this point, when she's in that state of... Um, almost living the ultimate role of womanhood at that point. Her role, she's playing to her role. At that point, the conversation is not garbage. It's sanctity. And that's when you realize that the problem of garbage or the, the problem of landfills and rubbish is not segregation, it's caste. It's that she's not, it's not her job. She's not supposed to touch it, she's too pure. Talking about wrong person, red bin, green bin, hoega, kisi ka. the person to touch it is the maid. What is the meaning of segregation to someone who, like, what does that word even mean to someone who's saying, I have to pick it up and I'll throw it under some tree because I have to go to the next house. I can't take someone else's garbage and go, no. Look at the words we're using. Look at the context we're creating. It sounds good. It sounds segregation. It's so English. Red wind and blue wind. It sounds so great. In the country, in the city, half of the people in their homes do not have more than one garbage can. Because more garbage can means more rubbish, more impurity. Segregation is not So where is your intervention coming from? What are you designing for? For us, that is what we were trying to understand. What is the context of human behavior in which there is already an organic design. Um, social norms, I won't go into all of them, but if there is some explanation there, there is something that if you can read it. Social norms are what am I supposed to, what am I expected to be like and what do people like me like? 
collective memory is what are my beliefs that i don't even remember having i had this con- there was i remember this conversation i had with someone who told me i don't know in india if anyone remembers when was the first time they heard ramayan it's almost like you're born and you're like mere ko tumhe malum hai ye story <laughs> right um linguistics we just spoke about right what are the labels that i use that then become my idea of what they are trigger step how do i feel about things now if i all of us sitting over here right now right it's a monday uh, evening if i tell you wear a helmet don't drink and drive you know like absolutely right this is this is yeah none of us we are not like this i'll meet you next friday right 1 o'clock and then you'll be like hey gaadi kisi ka to bhai chalega right I mean, it's okay. It's fine. We are all right. What happened? Are you lying right now? Are you lying right now when you're saying this is not something you'll do? No, you're absolutely right. You're you're speaking in in true faith. But the person on Friday who's going to drink is not the same person. And we have multiple. We have multiple personalities. We are all dealing with a disorder, right? Friday evening is a call of the era. Gadi bhai chala na is call of the era, and that is really what call of the era really is about. It's what, what are the norms of the people of my time? What is happening in this time that is going to decide the context for me? We look at these. There are some more. These are the at the bare minimum. We look at these five. There's another one which is a sixth one, which is what we call response mechanism, which is almost like the ping of your microwave. Like when you hear the ping of your microwave, what is that? It's a great design. But what does that tell you? Right? Something's ready. How do you know milk boiled? <laughs> Little late, sir. <laughs> there are a bunch of things. It's it. There's visual. There is auditory. There's a hissing. Uh, there is fear also. Ki abhi spill ho. I have to clean it. Right? There's a bunch of things that are happening. all of these things are a response mechanism if none of these things happened your environment is already operating on design whether it's your environment in a way if you look at it is perpetually communicating with you it's always telling you abhi kuch hua and if it doesn't tell you like kuch nahi hua then it is burn right even your environment will give you that signal and that is a six so response mechanism and these are six there are many hopefully you will discover them but these six if you just look for these six you will be able to understand analyze and influence human behavior at least that's been our experience that's all if there are any questions thank you that was wonderful and uh, now you know why i don't like the idea of you are doing questionnaire surveys and all right because you know at what time you ask what question That's what response you get, right? All right. So with that, we'll come to the next presentation. Uh, we'll just okay. You have got it there. Yeah. So let's just close this. No, you can. We will we'll sign off. Don't worry. I won't. I won't check through your emails. <laughs> okay. Now we go. Here you have right. Just a minute. Okay. Yes. Right. We'll just share this so that others. I think screen is already shared. Okay, that's good. Just a moment. Yeah. all right uh, so i'll give a quick intro to vishal by vishal and uh, so so i mean he starts with uh, his sort of philosophy or phrase that sort of dictates his sort of approach to life which is you go where you look um, and uh, he was here last week as well or the week before uh, so that was quite incidental because i didn't know that you guys were also inviting him so i didn't i mean this became like you know back to back but that's okay 
Uh, it's more uh, good to have more of this. So um, we have known each other for quite a long time. Uh, I'll sort of quickly run. He currently works with uh, uh, in the innovation area, industrial metaverse innovation at Siemens Xverse Lab. Uh, here he blends human-centric design with cutting-edge technology, viewing setbacks as opportunities for growth, uh, as leadership in transformative UI UX projects, uh, by meticulously looking in details and creativity, design thinking, clarity of thinking, addressing complex endeavors. So uh, I'll stop it there. I'll let Vishal talk, and of course, some of you, and many of you, are rather know him. So I'll ask you to introduce yourself and then. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Am I audible enough? OK, great, fantastic. Uh, so some very interesting uh, talks, actually. Uh, mine is little, probably going to be a little uh, uh, remorseful because the topic I picked up was a project which I worked extensively on research side, but uh, also one of the only project which I actually worked extensively on research. But anyways, uh, I'll just quickly introduce myself uh, just for people uh, who are new to me. Uh, Namaskara, I'm Vishal. I love designing meaningful experiences, and I design meaningful experiences at Siemens right now. Uh, I love solving problems, uh, especially in the industry currently. Uh, there are a lot of tough problems out there, and I have around 15 plus years of experience in design, uh, in uh, multiple designs. In fact, I've, I've started as a uh, product designer, then I moved into, I mean, I was designing uh, portfolios, uh, like Anas started logos, I used to design portfolios for people. A lot of NIFT students, in fact, got them designed for me, in fact. Uh, then I designed logos as well, uh, initially for free for people, and then uh, uh, went into designing for uh, money, a few of them. Uh, then I uh, worked with a couple of startups uh, which were into medical devices. So the initial past part of my career was into designing medical devices like uh, a mechanical CPI device for uh, patients. It was again a startup uh, uh, by a couple of our uh, uh, seniors, uh, Mr. Uh, Ratanjit Singh, uh, Singh and uh, Jain Karve, two of uh, very uh, great designers and engineers that I met. Uh, then I moved into the corporate sector when I um, had a little bit of financial crisis in my life. I realized that uh, this thing is not going to work out this way. So I'm moving. Uh, so yeah, uh, and I did my master's uh, uh, right here in this very building. Uh, I like uh, uh, Rebecca Singh sir said uh, that we cleaned up the thing, and so when we entered this building, this this very hall was a mess. It was a stockyard. So we students got together and uh, I think we took about three or four days to clean up the entire thing and put this together back again. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was it. And then, um, yeah, so over the years I've worked on multiple projects in AI, healthcare, sports, uh, design a cricket uh, uh, practicing, I mean, cricket learning app uh, for uh, a company called, uh, okay, I don't remember the company, but anyways, uh, then industrial monitoring and management solutions at Siemens uh, for the last six years. Uh, currently, we're working on um, uh, industrial metaverse experience. I know metaverse has taken up a hit, but uh, industrial metaverse is big, and Siemens is driving it forward for the industry. Uh, and we're lucky to be a part of the team which is working extensively on this, writing papers and patents on this. Uh, yeah, so a little bit of my personal life. I started with cycling. I used to cycle long distance when I was a kid. Uh, I have photos of me cycling on my BC champ when I in my younger years, and then moved on to uh, Hercules. And then now it's into biking, where I travel across India. I've gone to uh, Guwahat, I mean, sorry, I've gone to Nagaland, uh, Rajasthan on bike and uh, back. Uh, another interesting, uh, basically into art, where I uh, started with the uh, pencil and paper, uh, uh, pen and paper again, and then moved into digital uh, slowly. And I have, uh, uh, I, I love uh, animals, and I, both the dogs that you see on the right corner are adopted. One is a Belgian Shepherd, which is uh, an abandoned, uh, I think it was almost three years old, and I picked them up and then another little pub which grew in our home. Now there's a kitten in my house. So uh, this is what I do. Now uh, I will go out of this presentation and move to the presentation that I want to talk to you guys about. Uh, how do I get there? Yep, yep, yep. And, and we'll open this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, so this is a project which I worked about, I think, 2016-17. Uh, but uh, I want to talk about this project because uh, there are a lot of uh, things that we, uh, as students of design, want to do and get don't get to do usually when you come into industry. Typically, it's because of business requirements. People want things to move fast, and there's already some set design somewhere else. It's a PDF, yeah. Command will work. 
Yeah, it works. Come on, Lalu. Cool. Um, so I was working for this company called uh, Herman and a team called a uh, team a design team called Lighthouse. Earlier, now it's no longer. I think it's called some human design or something. They've been rebranding themselves over the past few years. Uh, but uh, primarily, we were working with uh, you know our partners, Microsoft and Fortis over here. Uh, so Fortis had his application uh, had a sister concern company called Health Four. Now no longer exists anymore again. Uh, but they were having an application which was a, which was uh, installed across uh, different uh, hospitals. Fortis is a big Big chain of hospitals, in fact, uh, and they wanted us to uh, see how they can implement for why people are not using uh, health and the health for application, although it is very robust and very well built, and how can we improvise it, right? So we said, okay, fine, let's first uh, discover um, what exactly is the problem, right? But then they were reluctant. They said, we already know what the what the, what the consumers, what the users want. Right, we know already know what the hospitals want. We know what the nurses and doctors want. We have built a fantastic application and stuff. We say, okay, just give us two weeks of time. We'll come back with a study. We'll we'll go to we'll we want to study your uh, different kinds of hospitals. Again, in the hospital environment, there are different styles, right? There, there's a hospital which is which caters to a certain set of people. Uh, uh, in fact, there was a photos hospital in Gurgaon which looked like a mall. Like literally, you walk in over there and it's like they they have shopping uh, areas and stuff, cafes and shopping areas. So. We were surprised too. I mean, I was never exposed to that kind of a hospital ever. I, I, uh, I don't know. Somehow, uh, luckily for that matter. But when we went over there and then we saw that, and we were like surprised. So, uh, what we did was uh, we first went into uh, discovery stage. Right? We, we even before we went over there, we said, okay, fine. Let's uh, look at applications which are there currently in the market and why. What could be the problem? Just do a landscape study. Just understand what how the market of uh, you know these HMS or HIS and you know, hospital information system applications are. Right, so we we looked at a lot of these applications. Unfortunately, we never could really access them because of uh, business concerns that they have. So we used to look at you know a lot of um, uh, YouTube videos, their marketing material to understand what exactly was there, what are the USPs that they're selling in their applications. So with that, we also we did a, a Gartner uh, thing. Luckily, we got a um, uh, you know the, the Gartner report over there where we saw where uh, some of the key uh, uh, market leaders were. And we asked our uh, customer who, where do they want to see themselves? They were in the the top quadrant over there, right? Leaders. So, uh, so we wanted to see what, how can they become leaders over there? So we looked at applications like this, Info and Cerner's, and then um, uh, then we said, okay, fine. Now we understand the landscape. What is what is what what's going to what goes into the applications? Uh, so let's go and study the actual users who are going to work on it, right? So, uh, so what we did is. Uh, uh, we took about uh, two weeks of time. We identified three hospitals, three different kinds of hospitals and porters, uh, which cater to international customers, local customers, and probably middle class and little high upper class customers, right? So we took about four days. I think uh, uh, sorry, two uh, two weeks. We went to uh, three hosp one hospital in Bangalore and three hospitals in uh, uh, Delhi uh, to look at uh, to go and interact with the actual people who are using this application. Uh, it was a revelation for us, you know. Uh, so if you see that this is a this is a, uh, a snapshot which we had, we had about 130 users who we spoke to in person, recorded the videos, made notes out of those people to understand what's exactly happening. And this is about just about I was one of the uh, UX guys and other people were like uh, basically business analysts who were and subject matter experts who became who doubled in as uh, UX researchers for us. Uh, then we had an interview guide and all the stuff. I don't I won't go into the boring stuff, but this is the research stats. What is interesting is uh, what were the drivers? We get that okay again. Uh, we could characterize each of these personas into different categories like this, where we have uh, care coordinators, practitioners, givers, uh, controllers, and care supporters. So uh, all those different people that you see in a hospital environment uh, will fall under one of these categories, uh, right? Uh, so. We uh, also uh, came about like a lot of personas. In fact, you see, uh, you will, you'd probably ask me, why do you have Sister Nisha and Sister Chitra, uh, Sister Chitra, Brother CB, who all probably are nurses itself, right? But we had nurses for both specialized uh, areas of uh, treatment, and they have very different uh, activities. So we had to go through that, and then we obviously went to, went to that. What is interesting in all of these is is that uh, when we did recordings and we actually when I spoke to them, uh, we witnessed death. We witnessed a lot of. Uh, I mean, people just came in the ambulance. The the uh, I think it's called. Um, I don't know what uh, in the emergency alert uh, in the emergency area. They they come and then like you know suddenly uh, a daughter is crying because her father has passed away. 
uh, somebody is coming with a broken leg, bleeding leg, and all stuff. So we were literally there trying to see what exactly is happening. And these people are, uh, and the caretakers, right, the nurses and the people who are in the emergency care, they are rushing. They are always in a hurry. They are always in, in, in an anxiety mode. Where uh, we we do a journey map from there for the for them as well, in certain areas. I think, uh, uh, yeah. So something like this where we had to. We, this is like a very simplified version. After we did a lot of analysis of the thing, we literally saw people, you know, uh, tired to the core, and no longer they can stand for th for themselves, but they're there for your care. And these people are expected to go back to a uh, system where they're sitting somewhere in one corner and update every little thing that has happened through the day. It is painstaking. And uh, that is the reality that the software companies do not realize because they built a product. They just had some requirements in their mind that the product should do so and so and so and so and so and so, and they built a process around it. But they never saw, you know, uh, or maybe they've seen it, but they, they are, they're probably ignorant to it, right? So the emotions that these people go through. Every morning they come to every shift, rather I would say they have shift shift uh, process. Every shift they come and they come with a with a you know with a with a positive mindset. Okay, today at kuch karenge acha. Then they would uh, once they start uh, taking handover from the previous uh, uh, previous uh, uh, you know uh, nurses doctor, they go through a cycle of emotions where they are ang there's anxiety because some patient is not doing well. Kal to acha tha, aaj nahi kar raha. What is wrong? So then they have to understand what is going on over there. What are the different things? So through the day it goes uh, you know that way. So in when we recorded when we when we kind of sh shadowed and did a contextual inquiry with those people, we saw what they went through. Right, I mean, uh, they would basically. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, someone, let me talk. I think closer to the chest is working. Uh, yeah, was it? Yeah. So we we literally saw them uh, crying for help. We said uh, the shift is typically around like six to eight hours. But they end up spending about twelve to sixteen hours in the shift, and they go back home, take rest, and again come back. Uh, and why? Because the six hours to eight hours, they want to spend time with the patients. They don't want to sit on a machine. They don't want to sit on paper and write it and fill it up. They want to sit out there and take care of the patients. For them, it's it's either a baby or it's a bleeding patient. It's a it's someone who's come out of surgery or it's someone who's delivering a baby or whatever, right? So every patient is. I mean, for that particular nurse, it's very important. And they don't want to go and sit and again, you know, ki agar achha isko uh, I've catered this person, I'll go and fill up information. Somebody in the technical team also said, why can't we give them iPad or phones? Let let the notification which can be put in the phones, just zip it out and then enter the thing. That is not the case. They didn't even know how to use a touch phone that back then. You know, they were all using the button button phones. We asked them why are you using button phones when you can afford a smartphone. They said, uh, where is the time? I do. I'm not on Facebook. I'm, I'm in those days. Facebook was very famous. Not now. But I'm not on Facebook. I can't go on Facebook because I don't have the time at all to do anything of this sort. So a touch touch screen phone doesn't make sense to me at all. And and it's bigger. I mean, exactly. It's far more easier. So they just use phones to call to call to their own relatives or probably to their uh, you know uh, to the peers. And uh, how is information passed between people? People call up you know their landline phones, pass information to, uh, to each other. So a lot of process that they you know that they deal with that they, a lot of time is spent on all these these multiple kind of activities, which reduces the time they give for patient. So the main criteria. So the main criteria they wanted to do is, you know, spend more time with the patient, with the, with the, for care giving rather than you know spend time on technology. So that's that is the uh, more thing. So this is what uh, exactly we did, and then um, of course we what we proposed is we proposed uh, application that probably was you know uh, more contextual and uh, had a framework of uh, multiple applications put together. Again over here, we had multiple hospitals where uh, some hospitals would not use all of the applications. Right, so we can't give one big mammoth application to the people. People could choose. We propose that let, let people choose what what parts of the application they want. Somebody had a dental part of it, okay, yeah, pick, pick it up. Somebody had some other part, okay, pick it up like that. So that was interesting, and they liked it. Uh, again, this, these are principles which uh, we uh, designed it for, which is built for speed, bold, and modern. Why do we need speed? Because this is a very high, uh, high tension, high, uh, you know. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of things happening. We don't want something to slow you down. You want an application that would allow you to do things faster, quicker, and you know, much more seamless. So, and why bold? Because you're running around. You cannot look for small information. Hey, Baba, ye kahan likha? Kya likha hai wahan pe? 
hai na so information that is to be bold at the one glance you should know what is happening over there that should be the case and modern because we wanted them to feel a little more pride in the application they use we can't give an application which is already there like a 90s old uh, ms you know some application of that rather at least make it much much more uh, you know modern that so that they can say we had certain conversations where people said you know i spoke to another nurse from another hospital who said that they have a very beautiful application which looks attractive and they're looking at our application and mujhe bura lagta hai i feel bad about it so the sense of uh, social status also like you said right so this is one thing and uh, of course all of these things happened and then of course i want to come back to what uh, the process is now i'll just uh, change the screen sorry uh, over here very quickly i want i just want to uh, it's the same thing but i use this for my uh, for my interviews so i just want to share this with you so uh, this is a, a process that i i i, I mean it's the same process which we have but the way i identify my process is uh, is very different i i kind of uh, own this for myself by involving birds and i mean of course involving animals uh, see uh, what i want to communicate over here is that everyone has i mean design process is quite standardized to an extent but how do you make it internal internalized for yourself how do you identify with it so i started identifying design the entire process through uh, you know animals and because i kind of uh, uh, like investigating them and understanding them and that's why you see that you know like i have an owl for discovery a uh, user research for a, a, a cat for user research a spider for interaction design probably because it builds web and stuff uh, uh, skeletons and stuff and of course uh, visual design for butterfly and uh, um, a dog always sniffs out food wherever you keep it so it's a qa and then of course uh, the front end development who are the prob the probable factory workers who time in day and day out keep working on your uh, designs to make it uh, uh, you know a reality and of course a usability ev evaluation is zebra crossing so i used zebra over there uh, my typical process is this where i try to understand uh, you know i i try to frame questions based on this this is a typical communication uh, principle that people use they call it 6w 1h process or something uh, i try to imbibe it in design I mean, in the in the process itself when i research i i i put all on the questions across this and i see uh, how can i uh, you know have i missed out any little detail design is about details right every little question that you ask matters and uh, if you want to, if you can frame all your questions based on this you know this this uh, 6 w's and uh, one uh, one h i think you would have covered 99% of all the things that you want for to, uh, to start the design uh, yeah so uh, this has been a process of, of uh, across everywhere where be it a pre sales project be it a complete full fledged project on anything uh, in fact we use this on uh, multiple things i use this in multiple uh, projects of mine where we also worked for uh, dubai expo one small uh, we have one more minute yeah so yes okay so there is a very interesting uh, project which i spoke about in last talk as well it is uh, dubai expo 2020 project the way it came to us also was very interesting we were just we just finished our uh, day on a friday and we were getting ready to get back home uh, boss calls up and says uh, you know what is the call can you just join us so we all go to the lab space and uh, there's a call from uh, a colleague of ours who's in uh, uh, dubai uh, he's frantically calling and telling okay see look uh, it's a situation uh we are working for dubai expo it's a prestigious project and we uh, won the contract but the problem is that we want to we need to design an application which uh, which 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 will wow the user we have the we have the you no know, technology and everything over there but the look and feel the the very essence of it should be wow uh, okay we said okay what do you really want we just uh, he said okay we have something that developed from another existing team but we uh, the, the, the the stakeholders are not really happy but we need to do something about it we said okay fine challenge acha lete hain uh so friday tha then when do you want it he said uh, we would have wanted it today but we can take it till monday so saturday sunday kaam karna hai theek hai <clears throat> sorry yes exactly yeah <laughs> so we said okay fine theek hai to kya karte hain so uh, we, we we put together a small team of people with different uh, mindsets and different uh, uh, ch- you know te- uh, talents uh, somebody who could tell a story somebody who could uh, create uh, you know uh, bring to life what our ideas was somebody who could probably build the entire journey of it and somebody who could probably you know be a supportive role to all this stuff so four of us got together <clears throat> and we said okay fine what do you do so i had some experience uh, from pre sales so i just said okay why don't you make a video let's not build an application let's not build a screen nothing 
will sell a story right uh, what do they want they want to know how their uh, users who are probably maintenance engineers will enjoy the application this they need to get some sense of pride right the dubai expo it is dubai expo and people are going to use the application on tablets and walk across and do things so they would they should take a feel the sense of pride when they walk around and say you know what this is my application right and i do i do cool stuff with this so we uh, got together we built a beautiful little 18 to 15 as in 15 to 18 second video where we just presented uh, if you work with us what kind of experience can you look forward to right so we basically uh, took this uh, thing very quickly wrote down stories what is dubai famous for luxury uh, money uh you know all the uh, all the fancy things in life uh okay so where is it happening of course i mean who are who are going to come to this thing the entire world is going to come land over here it's 137 buildings of so many different countries are going to come together and put up their stalls over there so all of these questions put together we kind of arrived at a, a, a huge mood board like like we had a white board like this uh, we filled it up with complete uh, posters and notes and drawings and then finally we came up with a very beautiful video a 15 second video and then we presented it the 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 teams who were involved simply said they actually said the same dabang dialogue that time said ki itne chhed kiye ki humko pata nahi kahan se kya kya bole like we were stumped basically that's what they wanted to say so i would only say that you know when you really apply i mean there are multiple design tools across industry right tools is not your uh, tools are only your friend they not you right tools is i mean a designer is someone who understands uh, the users the the context of the uh, users the context of the scenarios they understand these questions really well and how to employ them to re- to arrive at the right kind of questions to arrive at the right kind of uh, you know insights that's me- that that's what makes you a designer I-, i would say that tools are you know anyone can learn figma anyone can learn sketch anyone can learn autodesk spend about spend a month on it you can learn it but how to use it how to best use it for the you know for for building a meaningful design is what makes you a designer thank you right thank you uh, i would like to invite all the panelists on this side and again uh, so the current first years have sort of got fed up with me talking about time management project management i keep demonstrating myself how poor i am at that so what was supposed to be a 40 minute session is already about two hour session uh, so i'm left with very little time for the rest of the session but i'll invite the panelists and try to get through the questions as quickly as possible so please uh in the meanwhile so uh, yeah please sit here there was another microphone somewhere yeah so um we'll take two questions in the meanwhile two to three questions uh, before i jump into my questions so any questions oh there are, there are too many questions okay i don't know how to order it Uh, we don't have a lottery system. Okay, we'll take the first four hand. For Shanas. Uh, yeah, design pulley. What does pulley refer here? <laughs> is it the tiger pulley or something else? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is the tiger pulley. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> had the vernacular also into this okay thank yeah. you right. so that was a very good question i like such short questions with very simple answers <laughs> yes okay so my question is regarding that uh, a fashion recycling yeah so uh, it, it, yeah it is a you know uh, the face of it you know does it solve the problem actually in the sense if your general uh, motivation is the 30% or so unsold staff right uh, how does that solve this problem because 30% of a bigger number is a bigger 30% right that means if that 30% comes back to the store with a new batch right even that 30% is a bigger 30% i um, no no i don't know this so is the issue is this that This is the first part that you know you have some in some sense cheaply available raw material which you are recycling is one thing second the solution that you are proposing is it scalable unless it is scalable then it is not going to be commercially viable 
Um, I kind of totally agree with you on this because um, very rightly pointed out the thirty percent. I mean, we, there's no there's no guarantee which clearly says that what you produce will sell at hundred percent. It doesn't. So, uh, which is the reason why I think it also became imperative for designers to think of making products which can actually be. I might use this word here, deconstructible. So I don't think it should be something which is a by the fly option. I mean, this was just a starting point because I wanted to see if the possibility of a deconstructed product itself will will be uh, will be taken in by the consumer or not. But uh, you're quite right; that may not actually solve the problem. What might solve the problem is lesser consumption. So, which for uh, for uh, a large section of the society, uh, it needs a longer period of time because we have been reinforced continuously saying consume, consume, consume by whatever mechanisms we have. Our, you know, we have. Uh, we were talking about social context. We were talking about context architecture. I think a lot more of these kind of are able to nip the problem in the bud because we will probably be able to buy only what we need, and then of course our other stochastic models kind of you know kick in place. But if not, then the, I think the role of the designer is to produce in such a way that probably the product in itself can kind of go through a quick revamp and it's it might just sell again. So it's a kind of a rebirth. So if there's a facilitation for a rebirth done at the time of birth, it might help. It might not solve. It might help. Good to have a Thank you. Uh, one thought: if you make the cost of that 30%. Right now, the 30% cost is absorbed in all balance sheets. Levi's has been making profits for the last 50 years. So that 30% is all factored in now. Yeah, absolutely. If you increase the cost of disposing that 30% hugely, then change happens. Because the boardroom change of saying, let's make 20%, 10%, 5%, or 0% more, Sales forecasting is all of it. Then what are you going to kill? It can happen. Absolutely, I agree with you. Tukka is the word. Tukka, yeah. everybody is loving on Tukka. Yeah. And so, actually, the behavior change is probably at the management level. Absolutely. Not really at a design level. Um, I think we kind of have to work together on this. Yes, a lot more of it is management level. I think a lot of it is behavior change. And if you really need a change, then like, like what we said, we need to sell less for consumption. But I think... <laughs> Yeah. So just to sort of make sure that I for the rest of the time and manage time and not let this particular top this particular topic to continue. Yes. So any other question? This I'm sure this I will go out and talk. Yeah. Any other question? All right. Nobody has a question. I like this audience. <laughs> now I mean for a short while if you don't ask questions. It's, it's a guilt, right? There's always a guilt somewhere or the other. All right. So we'll start with uh, my questions, which is. And we have heard already stories of your own design understanding evolving, but just to reiterate from your own sort of ideas, which is what does design mean to you now? And uh, okay, let's start with just just that. What does design mean to you now from your current understanding? Uh, okay, for me now, design is no longer about just creating a functional or aesthetic product, which as design students we were taught to. I think design is a lot more about uh, conscious consumption and how do you make products in such a way that they get uh, consumed only when they are needed to. So I think that's the that's the shift I have. Amen. Um, for me, um, I think, can you hear me? Is this better? Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, design is a little bit like Externalized thinking. It's almost like design does a thinking for you, and then you just left to act, right? So, um, and if that is the that is pretty much the reason design is that powerful, because it does all your thinking for you. Um, what you're really designing is the context of the behavior you choose to influence. Um, there have been multiple, like I've I've had multiple boom moments um, working across segments that have uh, that have showed me that to think we're developing a product or to think that we're developing a service or we have an idea. I worked in advertising for many years, and um, at the end of the day, a jingle is going to save the day, you know. And then you realize that that um, 
yeah but that's still a tool you're still creating a tool you're still creating a product but it's only when you create that context that you will actually influence human behavior so for me design would be that yeah uh, sorry i was looking to my phone because i uh, wanted to get this quote right uh, so for me when i started off uh, uh, in the design uh, area uh, there was a uh, very nice statement i read from one mr robert l peters who was a graphic designer from uh, uh, from i think canada he said uh, design creates culture culture shapes values values determine the future right so uh, this is this 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 basically this uh, uh, statement stuck with me because uh, it 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 showed us that uh, uh, no uh, the world bestowed a trust upon us as designers to to create a culture to to you know, to influence a culture that's going to be tomorrow right we look at the past we look at a lot of things we'll, we understand that's what we do right when we do research when we do a lot of things uh, it's design what is design basically design is to make something make something basically very beautiful meaningful that's left to people to do it but design means make something uh, to make something so how are you to make it meaningful why are you to make it beautiful why are you to build a culture through what you uh, do right so that stuck with me and that, that has stayed with me all throughout and uh, my philosophy in design has been simple that way it's like whatever you do design uh, whenever you design something make sure that it is meaningful for people who are involved in it and people who may be involved with it at some point of time right i asked the same question yeah yeah um see professor vishal i think um, uh, see life is uh, very difficult right i mean uh, life is always uh, have been difficult for people so design is uh, basically there to give a better let us say an experience or a hope for people so that is what i always uh, think about that it can be by let us say solving some uh, existing problems or it can be about let us say by inventing new stuff and things like that ultimately it is about improving people's lives so that is what it is and uh, uh, one of the principle which i uh, <laughs> always like to ask as a designer uh, i always wanted to um, seek boring stuff right and then make that less boring for others so that is what i always wanted to do yeah right thank you i know i'm asking profound questions in ten, and asking you for in 10 minutes to present all your work and all that but the idea is of course to start the conversation and it shouldn't stop here so i'll agree to the second question uh, on the same i'll start with anas and with the other way around uh, so uh, i mean now with your uh, gray hairs and a lot of experience you can have philosophical stance on what design is but somebody graduating from school and looking for a job the industry also see as a designer who who's a workforce so uh, what does a designer mean to the industry when there as a fresher and how do you how does a fresher balance what you now understand as design versus what they have learned in school as doing things making things <laughs> uh, yeah and you start with <laughs> um so uh, i was a part of uh, uh, tcs for what about 12 13 years actually so in my life there what i understand is like i mean whenever uh, uh, we are taking new people right or freshers to our team what i see is like i mean uh, every everybody wants to basically change the world right so uh, that is their first thing most of the time so what we always try to tell them is something like i mean try to uh, understand uh, let us say the basics uh, of including let us say uh, uh, look at some of the requirements and then converting those requirements into some tangible things and then probably try to uh, 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 do a uh, design uh, in, in in the right way and all those kinds of things so uh, for for a newcomer or a for, for a fresher what we always uh, wanted to tell them was like i mean read stuff uh, research about a uh, lot of things that are happening there in the design field and then try to contribute to that so it can be let us say through uh, something like creating a new logo or it can be something like creating a new application for somebody so it is mostly about uh, seeking out um, a knowledge what is rightly happening right now in the world and then try to uh, uh, learn things from that so that is what i always wanted to uh, tell the new designers bye right, thank you yeah uh, thanks for the question vishal uh sorry sorry yeah uh are you okay thank you uh so uh okay i uh, just collecting my thoughts sorry uh, so uh, we've been uh, uh, I mean, I've been doing a lot of interviews. Uh, I've been doing a lot of interviews for uh, 
uh, for people in my team uh, to join my team. And uh, what we discovered, what we saw is people talk about, um, you know, having, knowing Figma, knowing tools, I mean, sketch and all this stuff. I can do this, I can do that. And then they show what they can do as part of their portfolio. But what, what the missing essence in that portfolio is uh, their own principle. Design, I mean, what, what, do they, what do they feel about design? Uh, how do they show they showcase themselves as designers? Like I'm not looking for a draftsman to do some stuff for me, right? I'm looking for someone who can put some thought into what they're doing, what they're working on. What is their philosophy? How do they build that philosophy? Are they reading? Are they looking? I mean, you don't need to read books for building a philosophy. You can also be involved in things like comics. You can be involved in, you know, uh, art. You can be involved in something that's not verbal or textual. So build your own philosophy. But the idea of uh, you know having your own sense of design, what is right, what is wrong, is important, and that's what we look for in people. Uh, Addition to that is also uh, we, see, we try to see how much of an effort are they putting into other things in life apart from the design skills. Like in the, in the previous talk, uh, in, the, in the last week itself, uh, Open Day, I was talking about uh, being a T-shaped uh, personality, right, and how important it is. This is where we look at because we want those kind of people in our team, at least in the, in the team that I work in, where we want to see people who are not just, uh, you know, trained to be designers, right, with skills and stuff, but uh, we want to see people who can put a thought if something unique comes into their plate, can they think beyond certain things? We don't want to do a fact. We don't want to build a factory of people who can design screens day in day out. We want to uh, build people. We want to uh, in people or build people who can think differently, who can think wild, and see how that can make sense in the context of the business that they're working for. Um, I'm not sure this is the best advice in a <laughs> in an institution, right? But um. See the the sit the sitting in and uh, following practice and then knowing what's what has to be done and then doing it exactly. That's for us. We VMIs to pay, and um, you know we've gotten used to a certain lifestyle. We won't take the bus anymore, and you know so uh, we've got these problems, self-inflicted issues that we've we've got. Um, if you're in design, you have to please do not allow your rebellion to quell. If you've taken design in the first place, you're here because I'm not on that, right? Um, that is so needed when you when you come up here and replace all of us, and even before that, so you can replace us faster, right? Um, I I want to talk about a a, a a very simple example here, um, and this was not a project that we worked on. It just came. It just happened because it's in the world, and if you when you go out into the world and just ask a couple of questions, things come up. Right. We were working with uh, we were working with a couple of tribals in in the country at one point in time, and um, it was a conversation on on women entrepreneurship and empowerment for for in the tribal areas. Completely different topic. Completely different topic. But we realized, I mean, how am I supposed to understand the woman entrepreneur if I don't understand the woman? And femininity is not necessarily like in this room. Femininity is not the same as it is out there, right? And when we were having this conversation, just out of the blue, out of nowhere, the conversation started becoming about interesting privacy. And um, I'll I'll keep it a little concise because it can get um, weird. One of the campaigns that is running in a lot of these places for a bunch of years now is um, about stopping open defecation. So we have the Darwaza Band campaign. We have campaigns that speak about building toilets and sanitation, which has been done in a bunch of places. At least the room is ready. It has a door. It doesn't have water. It has a door. It's fine. This is start, right? Um, They have built the toilets. They have built some of the places even have the water. They store firewood in it. They don't use the bathrooms. And then we say, what is the problem with these people? Yeah, मतलब भला करो करेंगे नहीं. Whatever you do, you give them. अभी क्या मतलब go and now do I send you to the bathroom like a kid? What are you supposed to do? Right? A lot of the conversations come out like that. But and because an intervention has been designed, पैसे तो खर्च हो गए, blouse तो सिल चुका, right? 
we've already done all of this and and this is this is the classic scaling issue we've done it it's been approved it's out in the market we could scale it we need to this is these are the numbers we are monitoring uh now we have to run with it when you start speaking to them you realize that it has a really deep connection to something else altogether which is that now when i said it will be so obvious right um check the numbers more than 80% of the rapes in this country happen during open defecation they happen when women go out into the woods and women do not go out in these places whenever they want right they don't do a little dance and then when they have to go to the loo and then just land up at some place they go either at dawn or they go in the night they go in the dark they go when there's no one watching there are times and these are the times that are the most vulnerable they go in groups women going to the loo together is not just an urban legend it is something that happens um, a lot in these rural areas a lot of time is for protection right you have your friend with you to make sure nothing happens and yet it happens now imagine supposing if your dad or your husband in this case built a toilet in your house that means you no longer go to the forest or the woods with them look at what you are breaking this is one thing but look at a bigger thing that happens if i build a toilet one toilet in my house for the women to use which is my communication which is my design which i am trying to scale if i build that toilet it means my girl is been touched why have you built a toilet otherwise something happened no so after you build a toilet will she go who will marry her before we get down to drawing on paper quickly and before we get down to solving a problem and answer what is the problem you are trying to solve in the first place i plead to you would be put the paper down close your pencil First, understand what you are solving because I mean, I really, you know, parroting it like like continuously. But you are designing context. You are not designing a product. First, understand what you are designing. You are designing some. You are designing a part of human life. And your design is going to be used by your users to design their lives. The second order effects of these are very important. So, yeah, that is what I would urge you to keep in mind. i think that that's i think very very beautifully put i think kind of uh, mantra that uh, i think every designer needs to have just to add on a little bit more to it i think an additional quality which every designer should have considering the fact that you've chosen design as a career is perseverance there are it does go be no sure shot methods of solving problems of making things look good of getting functional right functional wrong so there are going to be failures and probably for every 100 ideas that you put across 99 of them will be failures one of them might work so quick fix is not going to work however big a designer you are i think we need to be very very perseverant considering the fact that you have chosen this design design uh, the design as a uh, as an area and you walked into it with eyes fully open i think perseverance is something that we need to have at all points of time I'll move to the next question. Working? I think it's working, right? So I'll move to the next question. I have uh, four minutes and uh, eight of you. I mean, eight answers in the sense two set of questions going. So we'll have to keep it short from both ends. I took long to explain that. Uh, so the question is basically, uh, if you can sort of point to specific experiences or events that have shaped your thinking on design now. Specifics. Four minutes. No, no. You have a minute each. to tell me about your experiences or uh, people who have shaped your thinking about design events experiences people and in what ways that's a lot of okay. things i know a lot of things so um, i i since you said one minute i'll try and see if i can say something which kind of is overarching what comes to my mind at this point of time uh, i kind of resonate with the whole idea of people being different from different context i think my uh, whole idea of design has been shaped from the fact that i stay in a microcosm of an university which has people from all kinds of 
places at India. So I have people from north, south, east, west, young, old, or I mean younger, older, if I may put it that way. And you know, speaking all kind of languages, all kind of dialects, celebrating all kind of festivals from any corner of uh, India. Our parents, some not some of them, uh, you know, really barely ma making ends meet. Some of them are these Rolls Royce types, you know, the ones who are extremely luxurious. All kinds. And uh, the moment you have this whole microcosm together in one place, you realize that you know, uh, it, it, it's not. It's not a one size fits all. I think it's you need to design differently for different people, and everyone has their own context. Definitely not something which works the same way for everyone. So I think that's been my biggest takeaway. Thanks to where I work. Um, coming from the same uh, place that I was talking about, but very quickly to put it, uh, when we were talking to these women, one of the things that we were supposed to design for was their wish for empowerment and the wish for entrepreneurship. For them to start their own businesses, and as we started speaking to them, we realized that they could. They wanted a job. They didn't want a business. So uh, honestly, it was so simple because we were looking at what do we design for them. We realized all you needed to tell them was that the place that you are going to go to operate your own machines, your own machines, your own machines are going to be housed at a particular place, and this is your workplace. This is where you come for a job. It was as simple as that. We literally did not have to design anything else. Uh, it made designing the products also much easier because it meant they they stayed at the same center. Um, this for for us was 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 I remember it was a it was a pretty it was an interesting project because we came up saying you just say this we don't have to do anything else. Uh, thank you. So uh, there are three things for me. One was uh, CPDM itself and uh, uh, people the faculty like uh, the Bakasin sir who asks us tough questions during our uh, you know review sessions. I'll tell you that's uh, uh, I mean that he really put those questions. I mean he, when he asks his questions, we find it a little difficult to answer, but that's the crux of everything. It is the little details that um, the the very basic things that you should be able to answer, right? That's the first thing which I learned. Uh, at least that changed my life as a designer. First thing. Second thing is uh, uh, you know when you you really need to immerse yourself in people's environment to understand. Like you know you uh, people say put yourself in other shoes. Those, those shoes might not fit you. Right. Go immerse yourself. Talk to them. Be with them. Be around them to understand what's happening, not just with them, but with their environments. Right. What's what's the, what's the context of their environments they're working in? What is affecting those environments, and uh, how is it you know uh, affecting them as individuals? So that is the second thing. Third thing is uh, I think uh, whatever you've uh, studied in the past, your experiences come into picture. So keep them. Always make notes of every experience that you uh, come across. Write down what you uh, when you see something. Write down about it. What you felt about it. Like Anuska says uh, about logos, right? He writes about different logos. I think that's a very good practice because that builds your hypothesis about things. That builds your thinking about things. As a journal, right? That's that people uh, emphasize on this. Uh, we as Indians, uh, what I've noticed, uh, including myself, don't have a habit of journaling things, which is very important. Uh, because that when you, when when you really want to think about something, you can always go back and reflect and re read about it and see what you felt about it and come back to it. That plays a very effective role in how you think about the future forward. Thank you, Anas. Yeah, um, I would like to uh, talk about idea and execution, right? So many of the time um, we were told that yeah, originality of the idea or the innovativeness of the idea is the most important thing, right? But uh, what I understood, let us say after. Uh, uh, my career in uh, uh, UX design and all, what I understood is that execution is more important, mainly because um, the same idea, probably multiple people can uh, basically come up with the same idea, right? But uh, how you are executing the idea, are you thinking about, let us say, uh, end of life activities of a product and all the other things that actually matters most. Um, so it's always about uh, the execution, not about the originality or innovativeness of an idea. Right, that is good, and crisp. So I'll ask the last, second or the last question, and crisp answers, no more than a sentence sort of. Now I'm being very mean, I know. Uh, so what's the next frontier in design or design research? We'll start with you, Anas. Ah, uh, you put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm seeing that I think um, uh, there there is a lot of uh, uh, talk regarding that is a generative um, uh, AI and all those kinds of stuff. So um, my point is that uh, generative AI tools will be 
tools for designers, right? So that will be a stepping stone for us. That will be something like, I mean, we can look forward to the ideas created by uh, any generative AI tool and then probably build on top of that. So I, I believe that AI is here to help us. Uh, that's that's my thought. Uh, OK. Uh, Short answers only, so yeah. Uh, I would say uh, uh, user experience for virtual ecosystems is what uh, is the next frontier for research because uh, uh, today we're talking about metaverse, tomorrow it could be some, some other universe, right? Uh, so that's the reason why we also named recently Christina lab called Xverse. X being, you know, um, anything that is like chemical X of, uh, you know, the pop of girls, exactly. That is my inspiration. In fact, I, I, I named it that way. So now, now you're going into explanation modes <laughs> no. later. So basically, it's that you know. Uh, I think um, the virtual spaces is going to be is go, is going to stay here, uh, and technology is going to build up on it. So uh, uh, UX for this area is very very uh, necessary, and uh, that's what we are spearheading and we're working on. And that I would see that's the future of uh, UX as of now. In spirit of the direction of India, I do think our frontier is back. Look back, there is. Everything is not always forward. Uh, the reason we do things sometimes stem from our past, from our collective memory. There is a lot of inciting there. Uh, I think again within the very localized uh, context of uh, what we have right now. Yes, we have AI. Yes, we have virtual. But I think at the end of the day, um, at least in the Indian context, it has to be human centric design. There is a mind which is designing and it is still human. So at the end of the day, we have to reach back there. So I don't think we should let go of that. Great, thank you. Uh, and with that, we have come to this part of our, yeah, this part of our uh, event done, but at least I've seen two of our alumni from the 18th batch join. One of them probably got frustrated of my delays and has left, but at least I see Samrat there. So Samrat, please introduce yourself. Tell us about your journey. Uh, what have you been doing since you graduated and where, you know what it has been like. So please come on the camera and introduce yeah. yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, myself, Samra. Uh, yeah, regarding the journey after leaving CPDM, I think uh, I did a very interesting uh, experience with starting with the MedLife as a startup and then within nine months, I've become a design lead there uh, and leading a team and also identifying the right uh, putting down the put down and understanding that we need to do the research for everything it's not just making the screens i would say and after that i i found a very good mentor with me like maybe Pudi ravi was the director of design for medlife at the time and then we have been after that collaborated more working with multiple companies now i landed on to the intuit it's an amazing place to work. It's uh, the design first. Uh, and then I'm currently working with a product called TurboTax Desktop, uh, which is an attack software for uh, US and Canada. And I'm current, currently leading the experience for that. And we are trying to imagine in an experience where uh, it will become a middle ground for the online experience and the desktop experience. That is something that we are inventing right now. Yeah, that's all for me. Yeah. Great, thank you. So um, just to let uh, many of you know, uh, our current website, which still runs, which is supposed to have changed a few years ago, we haven't yet done it, uh, was uh, designed and you know, developed by Samrat and he's also been very active being a mentor of practice for our students. Uh, so he's uh, on a regular basis interacting with it. So thanks Samrat and thanks again for joining thank here. Uh, with that, we come to the uh, closing session of this. Uh, again, apologies for uh, the extension of the time, but uh, as a customary part, we'll close with uh, the formal uh, passing on certificates and memento to our uh, design ambassadors. So again, I'll briefly talk about what these ambassadors mean. So all these guests that we invite are supposed to be uh, now DM ambassadors. We are still calling this event CPDM because we are still celebrating 25 years of CPDM. So we'll continue to call it CPDM, but you are going to be our CPDM design ambassadors, hoping that you will talk good things about CPDM, take it out there, and of course, give us critical feedback as well, which we'll be happy to, right? But the other idea, of course, is that this is, right. <laughs> and the other idea, of course, is that uh, this is just the beginning. We'd like to invite you for longer sessions because there's plenty to talk about and there's a lot of interesting things that come, has come out. So 
I'll ask Professor Singh to please come here and then give on the certificates. Unless you have to come and collect yours. So for all our online uh, speakers, we'll show it here. Yeah, we'll give you the teasers. Oh, that's the camera. Oh, yes, the camera is here. Yeah. <laughs> this is right, so one other minor comment since uh, you, we, the certificates are designed to be signed by the current chair, Professor Chakravarti. So, right now it's not signed because he's uh, on travel. So, we'll get it back I, to I you with. That, you know, this is something in which a proxy doesn't look good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll cover this place at this moment. So, <laughs> Photograph. To come Who's taking photos? <laughs> Which one? Thank you and thanks everyone again. Thanks Anas and uh, and Samrat. And thank you all for joining again and uh, we can step out and talk. We are free, free to sort of continue the discussion. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, so that's why we